Anime Nyan here. The intro, please. Yeah! Dead by Daylight, we're back again and with a fantastic new introduction sequence. What are we doing today? Well, quaint that you might ask, because we're covering a Dead by Daylight theory again. Wow, what is it with me and Dead by Daylight theories? I have no clue. So a quick refresher, Dead by Daylight is a curious blend of survival horror and multiplayer genres in a single video game. The game has one killer and after four survivors, progressively hunting each of them down and sacrificing them in an occultic ritual to an evil god. But you know what? We're interested in the juicy details about the story. You see, Dead by Daylight is set in an alternate dimension. We can infer this much from the procedurally generated content, as in the shifting maps, which are never quite the same. Also, the fact that the survivors can go from a preschool to the Red Forest in Chernobyl to an insane asylum within the blink of an eye and back. Which raises the question, what is the single place which all these seemingly disconnected events take place in. Nobody knows where Dead by Daylight is set. He doesn't mention it in the purposefully vague lore. What backdrop could really canvas this chaotic and unsettling world of Dead by Daylight? Where could it be? That is the question. However, I want to say right now, before we dig any further, I propose the location in which all the events take place in is hell. But wait, hell is supposed to be a blazing inferno of fire and brimstone, not this, uh, what, what do you call this? Foresty, cool crepuscule environment tinted with foreboding navy blue tones? And yes, I do know that this directly contradicts my other Dead by Daylight theory on this channel. But I think it's an alternate perspective, alternate, alternate perspective, alternate, alternate perspective, and that's exciting. Now, let's rip right into it. For starters, the first incriminating piece of evidence is this. No one dies. Wait, but um, you just said that people were getting slaughtered and sacrificed on meat hooks. So, how is no one dying? Good observation passed me from about two seconds ago, but here's the catch. No matter how many times anyone gets sacrificed, they always return back to the campfire. So even if you die, you come back to life again in an infinite loop to be tortured over and over. Okay, they're not totally immortal as shown by the quote from our friend Benedict Baker. With each death, I feel myself weaker, a little piece of my soul devoured by the darkness before I awake. From this, it can be inferred that after a certain amount of times being sacrificed, one would kind of die. This is because your soul is the part of you which is kind of essential. And if you had your soul wholly devoured by a soul-eating being, you're pretty much dead. But the fact still stands. Victims of this game are still pretty immortal. They survive bear traps, yeah, with a lot of screaming, but with a simple slouch holding their stomach. Which is weird because your leg is here and uh, your stomach is here. Not sure why you would show getting a broken leg by holding your stomach. 
But hey, at least they got the shuffle right. Right? <laughs> In case you didn't realize, that was a joke. Yeah. I realize game developers can't actually spend so much time making animations for absolutely everything. So I don't really have a problem with it at all. I just find it really frankly just funny. Anyway, back to the main point. These survivors can survive injuries which are beyond the human capacity of surviving. They can also survive dying, dying in inverted quotes, when they finally pass the threshold of suffering and instead revive, going back to the campfire. Why? Why are they practically immortal? The reason is relatively simple. They are already dead. They cannot die anymore because there is nowhere for them to go. It makes sense. I mean, if you're already in the underworld, you can't actually go to the underworld because you're already there. <laughs> this is also really cool in how it plays into the mechanics of a multiplayer game. With players playing a dozen to a hundred to a thousand games and explains why the survivors can respawn. So props to the developers for thinking this out so well. Okay, next piece of evidence, the entity. You see, the premise behind Dead by Daylight is that it is a sick and demented kind of game. <laughs> well, that was slightly lame, but it's true. You see, the plot revolves around the entity, an omnipotent creature who pretty much takes pleasure in watching people be tortured and sacrificed in its name. So a lot of people get punished. It is essentially a game for the entity playing the survivors like marionettes. Brilliant. But how does this jigsaw piece fit in to the overall picture? Well, where else have I heard of a lot of people getting punished in an endless cycle? Hmm, hell maybe? You see, as every good transcendent galaxy engineer knows, an underworld needs someone to preside over it. So if Dead by Daylight was set in the underworld, who better to be a god than the entity? This is evidenced by Benedict Baker's journal, in which he says each killer seems pulled from a place of great darkness. Their own violent actions summons this most ancient of evils, the entity. So this quote has two parts to it. The most obvious being that uh, Benedict directly refers to the entity as the most ancient of evils. And according to biblical law and law from many other religions, sin has pretty much always existed. So it makes sense that it would be the most ancient of evils. As for the evil part, well, the king of the underworld would be a pretty close match as the epitome of all evil. So the second part of this quote alludes to the entity's formidable supernatural power as it can affect reality by pulling people into its dimension. This combined with the fact that it can build this alternate dimension just goes to show how magically powerful it is. And as fantasy rankings go, it is generally agreed upon that those who are magically powerful are at the top of the hierarchy, i.e. kings of the underworld. Okay, you say, suppose that the entity was the king of the underworld and thrives off the pain of hell's denizens, then why is it helping the survivors? You're right, it does help out the survivors. It allows them to escape into the mist. Just think, the entity is an all-powerful being who can create dimensions. So it wouldn't be a stretch to say that it could instantly kill a survivor. Why does it need to go to the trouble of 
creating an elaborate game of cat and mouse with killers and survivors in the first place. Well, you're out of luck because the key's in the fine print. No, not the hatch, not the skeleton key in the game either. I mean the figurative key. You see, in order for the entity to feast, it needs to feed off the survivor's hope. So if the devil made the games unwinnable for the survivors, that would mean that the survivors would have no hope. So it needs to make all the games seem fair, even though they aren't. Otherwise, the survivors will lose all hope, ergo they will become less appetizing and the entity won't be able to feed. But just because they seem fair, the games doesn't mean that the games are in any way actually fair. I mean, a supernaturally enhanced killer against four human beings, oh, and also the entity create, creating wep iridescent weapons to allow the killers to motorize the survivors more easily, that sounds weighted heavily on the devil's side. But personally, I would be the first to admit that if the survivors actually tried to kill the killer, they'd probably make the killer toast if all they had were the game's mechanics. But I'm assuming that the killer is actually much more overpowered than the game lets on for balancing reasons. And if the survivors ever tried to take the fight to the killer, the killer would bring out some serious supernatural power and instantly kill the survivors. The survivors. So the fact that the prospect is there of hope is to goad the survivors into believing that there is some sense of hope and when there is none, so, yeah, then when there is none whatsoever. Another piece of evidence is that the supernatural plays such a large role with the world revolving around a rather simplistic set of rules. This is obviously not real life, but we have to ask the crucial question, where does the supernatural play a large role? Well, a lot of places in fantasy, really, but hell is coincidentally, coincidentally one of them. Okay, now the last piece of evidence which I really want to go over is this. The survivors are all dead, explaining why they're in hell in the first place. So the game never actually states that anyone is dead. So how am I drawing this conclusion? Well, actually, I can only say that I know of one survivor who is explicitly dead. Laurie Strode is from the Halloween series, a set of slasher films from which Laurie Strode, the survivor, and Michael Myers, the killer, are taken into the game. You see, Laurie Strode is seen to have died in the film Halloween 4, The Return of Michael Myers. And yes, the Halloween series has a lot of timelines, which are really different, but I won't dive into that. <coughs> <coughs> because it's way too complicated for me. I'm really not too sure about which version of Laurie Strode Dead by Daylight used, so please call me out if I'm wrong. But anyway, from what I've found, Laurie is dead, yet she's in the game. A plausible explanation would be all the events in the game take place in the afterlife. And considering there isn't any angels and a lot of pain and suffering, I'm assuming this is hell. You see, it all goes back. Anyway, you know that this theory really would have been helped out by Nancy Thompson appearing in the game instead of Quentin Smith, because Nancy Thompson died as well in the in the Nightmare on Elm Street franchise, which really would have further boosted this theory, but because of licensing, uh, licensing issues, they didn't implement it, so I can't say that. Now, none of the survivors are actually said to be dead, so this theory kind of seems really sketchy from preliminary examination, but there's one more thing that made me add all this up, which is ghost amnesia. 
What? What do you mean? Yes, you heard me right. Ghost amnesia. You see, it's a common trope for people who die and are just souls to not remember the way that they died in movies and books and the events leading up to their death. And you see, coincidentally, none of the survivors from Dead by Daylight remember any of the events leading up to and arriving in the setting of Dead by Daylight. An example is in Benedict Baker's journal, yet again, which is as official of a law you can get, when, in which he says, I woke to find myself in this strange place. I have no memory of how I came here. Am I going on too much of a stretch? Maybe. Maybe it's just to create a sense of mystery, and I'm thinking way too hard about it. But the lapse in memory for all survivors seems pretty suspicious, if you ask me. Okay, so a final quick summary of the reasons why Dead by Daylight is set in hell. Number one, no one dies, as they're already in the Number two, the entity is the king of the underworld. Number three, the supernatural plays a large role in the game. Number four, the survivors are dead. And that about sums it up. If you feel like I may have gotten something wrong, please do comment below because my research is not always right and I really appreciate the second opinion. For everyone who reached the end of this video, I would really like you. Thank you so much for supporting me and being patient. I hope you enjoyed another perspective on what this video game, Dead by Daylight, is and seen the wonder that can come from something which may seem so insignificant, such as a game. Additionally, I would really like to thank everyone who stayed in this video, even if they have never heard of Dead by Daylight, because I know for sure that this may be a difficult watch, especially for those who aren't engrossed in this video. Anyway, I'm going to go, so enjoy your day and have some fun. Anime Yan. Yeah.